founder of uh, Prata Technologies and Perfect Cloud, something I learned recently. Um, today he'll speak on the harmonic volume of uh, Firma curves. So over to you, Professor Mo. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mahesh, for the introduction and thanks to the organizers for uh, um, all the hard work I know that goes into putting these kind of events together. I remember the great enthusiasm with which planning was started uh, quite a long time ago to have an in-person meeting uh, in, uh, uh, in India and uh, when the pandemic um, showed no sign, quick signs of abating, uh, how quickly pe people pivoted to uh, this online format and so hats off to all of them for their hard work for organizing this and it's uh, at least in the current circumstances it's nice to see all of you uh, of it uh, virtually. Uh, so I want to speak about the harmonic volume of Fermat curves and I should say that um, in the first instance that I'm going to talk about um, certain cycles on the Jacobians of Fermat curves um, and the way they live in the Chow groups and uh, I, I will stick to the uh, to giving an overview of the main elements that are that we are thinking about, uh, without worrying too much about details. So, firstly, to start uh, things off with, the Fermat curve is this curve in P two, uh, the projective plane, given by the equation x to the n plus y to the n equals z to the n, and its genus is a curve of genus one half n minus one n minus two. And uh, we may take its uh, Jacobian, which is an abelian variety of dimension equal to the, the genus of the curve. So it's a big abelian variety. Now, the Fermat curve, as you can see, has a large group of automorphisms. Namely, if I, if I multiply x by an nth root of unity, y by some other nth root of unity, and z by some third nth root of unity, it still gives me a point on the curve. So you have this threefold product of uh, the group of nth roots of unity acting as automorphisms on Fn. And, and because I'm working in projective space, I have to mod out by the diagonal, but I still get um, a large group of automorphisms. And uh, so roughly phi of n squared, uh, a group of that size. And now using those automorphisms, I can decompose the Jacobian. Uh, another way of saying it is that these automorphisms are also acting on the function field and I can look at um, subfields of the function field which are fixed by different subgroups of the, that group of automorphisms. That gives rise to quotient curves. So I've written uh, some of them down here, what I call C sub S. So it's given by the equation V to the P is U times one minus U to the S, where S is an integer between one and P minus two. So that's a certain curve and its function field is, uh, is a subfield of the function field of the Fermat curve. Um, and uh, it, it's, it's a quotient curve. Uh, and in fact, these quotient curves when put together give you uh, their Jacobians, give you the whole uh, Jacobian of the Fermat curve, at least for prime degree, n is a prime. Uh, I write J sub P for the Jacobian of F sub P. Uh, then it is uh, up to finite groups um, essentially the product of the Jacobians of these quotient curves, C sub S. So there are P minus two of them. And so each factor uh, in this, the Jacobian of C sub S is an abelian variety. Uh, in fact, it's an abelian variety of CM type, which means that it has uh, endomorphisms by a field of degree over Q equal to twice the dimension of the abelian variety. That's the maximum that's allowed. And uh, indeed, Jack, uh, the Jacobian of CS is of dimension one half P minus one, and it has multiplication by Q zeta P, which is degree P minus one. So that's the maximum that's allowed in terms of a field. So you have this isogeny. Isogeny means up to finite groups. J sub P is the product of the Jacobians. Now let's see if I can, add, uh, how do I go forward? Uh, let's see. Okay, good. Oh, good, okay. Now uh, there are some points that can be constructed on FP for free, almost for free. So if I take a sixth root of one of unity, eta, let's say, then by virtue of the fact that it's a sixth root of unity, I have the identity eta plus eta inverse is equal to one. And uh, now since any odd prime is plus or minus one mod six, it means that eta to the p plus eta inverse to the p is one. And therefore I have a point eta, eta inverse one on fp. I can project this point to any of the quotient curves. Uh, and they live on the quotient curve. And then from the quotient curve, I can go to the Jacobian. 
By the way, if you're not familiar with the Jacobian, don't worry, in a few minutes, I'm going to explain what that is when we, start, when we talk about cycles as well. Just think of it as an abelian variety of dimension equal to the genus of the curve. So I can project uh, from, uh, from the Fermat curve to the quotient curve, and then from the quotient curve, I can fix a base point and then map it to the Jacobian. And that gives me a rational point on the Jacobian. Uh, and it's in fact defined over Q. Even though eta is not in Q, this point is defined over Q. And a theorem of Gross and uh, Rorlich from, uh, I just realized this one is more than 40 years ago, is that as long as the prime P is bigger than seven, and with a few exceptional values of S, this gives a point of infinite order. So uh, that means that uh, uh, since remember the Jacobian of FP is the product of the up to finite groups is the product of the Jacobians of the CS, uh, you get uh, that the rank, the model V rank of uh, J sub P is at least the number of these factors. So they remember there were P minus one uh, factors here and um, um, three of them are excluded in terms of, I don't know whether this point is of infinite order. And so we get the rank is at least P minus five. Okay, this is a theorem about rational points. Now, of course, rational points are of great interest in number theory because you can think of them as solutions to definite equations. And in, you know, when we started out, we had an equation of something, usually a curve or a hypersurface, and, and you ask for rational solutions for that uh, equation. That, that's the question of rational points on there. But now we've gone to rational points on something more abstract, an abelian variety. But, but I want to go to higher dimensional versions of rational points. So rational points we can think of as zero cycles. Um, and uh, we want to ask about higher dimensional cycles. So here's the theorem of state at the beginning and then the rest of the time I'll be trying to explain it. Uh, it's joint work with uh, my former student, Payman Iskandari. Uh, what we proved is there's a certain family of cycles called Cherisa cycles. Uh, Teresa cycles on JP are of infinite order modulo rational equivalence for P bigger than seven. Okay, so these are not points. They are co-dimension, uh, they're, they're one, one cycles actually. Um, and they are of infinite order in, in what, I, what we might call the Chow group. And I'll explain what that is. So first let's, let's go slowly. What is, a, what is a cycle? So if I have a, some fixed variety X, then we may look at a formal, lin formal linear combination of sub varieties. So there are sub varieties Z sub I inside X, and I can take a formal lim linear combination, summation Ni Z I, with Ni's are in Z integers. So again, I insist that you understand it's formal. Now, there's no way, real way to add um, sub varieties that is a, they don't form a group, but you're you're forcing them into a group by looking at the free group generated by the sub varieties by different by the irreducible sub varieties. And if the dimension of each of these zi's is is a fixed d, then we call z itself a d cycle. So this this z is a d cycle. By the way, you'll notice uh, when I started preparing these notes, I was very enthusiastic and tried to use colors and so on because I, I realized this uh, iPad you can do all these things. But uh, you'll see later on <laughs> my enthusiasm uh, figured out and you'll just see straight math. Anyway, so if all this, these ZIs have dimension D, then you call it a D cycle. So for example, a zero cycle means that these are all dimension zero, in other words, points. So a zero cycle is made up of points. Now, one important uh, notation here, co-dimension of a cycle is dimension of X minus dimension Z. So the dimension here is D, the core dimension is dimension X minus dimension Z. And for various cohomological reasons, it's sometimes useful to, to work with the core dimension rather than the dimension. So for example, uh, a core dimension one cycle is called a divisor. So on a surface, for example, a curve is a divisor. On a, on a curve, a point is a divisor. Or a linear combination of points is a divisor. Similarly, on a surface, a linear combination of curves would be a divisor. Now there's a way to associate divisors to functions on X, a rational function on X. You can, you can look at the places where it, uh, where it vanishes. So I look over the irreducible subvarieties and along that subvariety, F will have some order. Uh, so here's the mistake. Uh, this, this order is, is some integer uh, times Z, not N sub Z, just Z. So that defines a certain uh, divisor 
uh, associated to the function. And that's called the divisor associated to f, something written like this. And <clears throat> so we may also think of divisors of functions as principal divisors. And that's the point of this notation is to, is to uh, think, make you think in that way. They're principal divisors and they basically come from the function field, whatever ground field k is, k of x. So in particular, if I look at um, a, a smooth projective curve, I can consider divisors of the degree, uh, I, I, can divide, yeah, I can consider divisors. So this is a curve, so co divisor means core dimension one, so it's a point. So I can look at linear combinations of points with n i's are some integers. And now I, I add an additional condition that the sum of the n i's is zero. So this gives me divisors of degree zero. And inside there, I have the divisors of principal, uh, divisors of functions, that is principal divisors. It's easy to show. Uh, this is a compact Riemann surface, assuming I'm over a, um, a characteristic zero field, this is a compact Riemann surface. And so uh, just by some calculus, you can show that uh, it's necessarily um, the, the sum of the orders of poles and zeros comes out to be zero. Uh, then uh, KFC is contained in this divisor, divisors of degree zero and the quotient divisors of degree zero modular principal divisors uh, is sort of the geometric version of the ideal class group. You can think of elements in here as, as ideals in a way. If you think of points uh, as being prime ideals, uh, this would correspond to an ideal. This, don't worry too much about this extra condition. And um, then uh, I'm basically taking ideals modular principal ideals. So it's a kind of geometric version of the ideal class group. And indeed the Jacobian over a finite field is exactly the, the uh, class group of, uh, of the curve. But what's important, what makes this different from algebraic number theory is that this is not just a group. This is not just uh, an algebraic object, it's a geometric object. It's this, this object is representable. In other words, there is an algebraic variety called the Jacobian, which has the property that its k bar points is exactly this thing. Okay, so it's somehow it, it's representable by some algebra geometric object. So that's a very special property. In general, if you go back, uh, at least over complex numbers, how you prove this, the critical point is use the Abel Jacobi map, which maps the Jacobian to this object. What is this object? So it, it maps it to some, well, before I say what it is, whatever it is, it's some compact complex torus. And what is this torus? Well, you, you fix some base point P0, and then you choose a basis of the holomorphic one forms, omega one to omega G. So that you know the, the space of holomorphic one forms on a curve of genus G is dimension G. So that's, let's take a basis like that. And then you, you send any point on the curve to the, the integrals from P0 to P1 of omega one, integral from P0 to P of omega G. And of course the, the curve C, if the genus is positive, is certainly not simply connected. It has a fundamental group. And so this integral is only well-defined modulo periods. So that's why you have to mod out by H1 CZ, okay? So, so you get uh, a compact torus uh, uh, and this, this is mapping to there. And uh, Abel Jacobi basically says it is uh, an isomorphism. And um, this thing, this object here is a compact torus, but not every compact torus, not every compact complex torus is algebraizable, but in this case it is. Uh, and that, that's a theorem that comes from the fact of uh, there exists a natural polarization that comes from a cup product on C. So you need to use the geometry of C to show that this actually is an algebraic torus. Mm -hmm. That's how you show the Jacobian, is, at least over C. Uh, there are more abstract ways to show it over, over other fields. Okay, so, so now this point is that when I'm studying um, divisors, uh, or rather um, divisors of degree zero on a curve, I have recourse to this object, which I call the, the Jacobian variety. Now, if I'm trying to study um, higher dimensional objects, it becomes a lot more complicated. So the theory of devices on curves doesn't generalize very well to cycles of higher dimensions on higher dimensional varieties. So the first thing that happens is we need to introduce equivalence relations. So here, remember we had, when we were looking at this thing, we, we, we looked at devices of degree zero and then we had to introduce an equivalence relation, namely whether it's a, it's a principal divisor. 
So we need, we have analogs of that, but we have actually three analogs of that in, in the higher dimensional case. So there's rational equivalence, algebraic equivalence, or homological equivalence. So rational equivalence means that, uh, again, I'm, I'm not defining this precisely. Rational equivalence means that I can go from one cycle. I, if I want to say Z is rational equivalent to Z prime, I want to say I've been able to move from Z to Z prime along a rational curve, along a P1. Okay, somehow I'm able to put a family of cycles together, which move, which are parametrized by P1, and which start off at Z and end up at Z prime. Okay, that's what it means for two Z and Z prime to be rationally equivalent. Algebraically equivalent is the same thing, except I replace the rational curve with any curve. So I should find some family of cycles on X parametrized by a curve C, which starts off at Z and ends up at Z prime. If I can do that, then I say Z and Z prime are algebraically equivalent. There are various other ways of formulating this, but this is the basic, the basic definition is this. Of course, rational equivalence implies algebraic equivalence because P1 is, a, is an example of a C. The converse is not true. And uh, then we have homological equivalence. Homological equivalence means that um, if I think of uh, the cycle, I can associate to it a homology class. Uh, think of it in the, oh, again, over complex numbers. Um, a subvariety is a submanifold, and to a submanifold, I have a, I have a, a homology class in a natural way. So that's basically the, the, the gen, gen, generalized. And then we say two cycles are homologically equivalent if their image in homology or in cohomology is the same. In other words, cohomology or homology is unable to distinguish between those two cycles. Okay, so what happens is here, if I have the big space ZD of X, of D cycles on X, then it contains the space of homologically trivial cycles. That contains the space of algebraically trivial cycles and that contains the space of rationally trivial cycles. So now the question becomes, which one are you going to look at? Which one of these? And it turns out they're all interesting and they're all difficult in different ways. Okay, so these are cycles, again, D, D cycles that are rationally equivalent to zero and D cycles that are algebraically equivalent to zero, D cycles that are homologically equivalent to, to zero and these are all D cycles, okay. So just to uh, by, give you context, um, if I look at various conjectures in arithmetic geometry, they deal with various quotients, not any one of these in particular, but quotients. So for example, the quotient of this by this is what is discussed in the Hodge and Tate conjecture. So all cycles of a D cycle modulo those which are homologically trivial. Okay, so cycles up to homological equivalence. So there's something called the cycle class map, as I said, that puts this into cohomology. I need to work here with the co-dimension. So that's why I replace D with D prime. D prime means the dimension of X minus D. So modulo homological equivalence, I get an injection of this into H2 D prime X, so the rational coefficients, or in the Eladic case into et al cohomology, Eladic cohomology. This, this D is called the Tate twist. And then the conjectures of Hodge and Tate is, are about the image. So how can I recognize if, if I have an element of here or an element of here, how can I recognize that it came from these cycles? So in both cases, uh, the conjecture, or, conjecture says that the way you can recognize it is there's a certain algebraic group operating on these spaces. And if the element that you're looking at is invariant under the action of that group, then it had to be in the image of this map. Okay? For the Hodge conjecture, it's called the Mumford-Tate group. And for the uh, Tate conjecture, it's the Zariski closure of the image of the Galva group inside automorphisms of the et al cohomology. And both of them can be formulated as Tanakian groups, um, Tanakian Galva groups. <clears throat> okay, so <clears throat> Hodge conjecture and Tate conjecture then are looking at the, co the first quotient here. <clears throat> the rest of the talk, what we're gonna be looking at is this quotient here. Okay, homological modular rational. That gives rise to something called the Chow group. But before I go there, let me just mention one more thing that um, uh, this is Hodge and Tate is doing this. Now, um, <clears throat> Birch certain Dyer conjecture and Block Balenson conjecture look at homological modular rational equivalence. In other words, this part, this modulo this. Okay, Hodge and Tate looking at this, and Birch certain Dyer, Block Balenson are looking at this. 
<clears throat> so homological modular rational equivalent. Now, interestingly enough, in both cases, both the Tate conjecture and uh, in, in these conjectures, there's an L function version. So in the Tate case, it's a, about, it's a conjecture about the order of pole of the L function at the edge of the critical strip is given in terms of the space of cycles. And in the case of Bloch, Berenson, and Bertrand and Dyer, it is, a, it is about the order of vanishing at a point inside the critical strip being equal to the dimension of the space of cycles of homologically trivial cycles, modulo rationally trivial cycles. Okay. So the, the Chow group that I mentioned is, is this one here, this group here, um, at least the, this particular version of the Chow group is D cycles, which are homologically trivial. That is, uh, uh, it's all homologically trivial cycles, modulo rational cycles. If I don't put this decoration harm, then uh, the Chow group is usually just all cycles, modulo rationally trivial cycles. Okay, now how are we going to study this? Well, you remember in the case of points on a curve, we use the Abel Jacobi map to get into the Jacobian. So, in the higher dimensional case, also you have an Abel Jacobi map. Um, and um, <clears throat> uh, it maps, oops, uh, yeah. <clears throat> so, let's say I have a smooth projective variety over the complex numbers. The Abel Jacobi maps maps homologically trivial D cycles to some complex torus. <clears throat> now, unlike the one dimensional case, the case of curves, this is not algebraic. Okay, so you're not looking at an abelian variety. It's a torus. It's called the intermediate Jacobian. And we don't need to worry too much about the details of the definition. It's defined in terms of the Hodge filtration. So there's a certain descending filtration that is associated to the complex cohomology, to the cohomology of, of X. And we're looking at something which is roughly halfway in. So the, the, the Hodge decomposition here allows you to represent elements of H2D plus one in terms of differential forms, uh, uh, which are indexed by the degree of hol holomorphic component and the anti-holomorphic component. And the filtration, the, the Hodge filtration Puts, a, puts some restriction on the holomorphic part. So the intermediate Jacobian is, some, is the dual of this piece of the Hodge filtration modded out by um, the uh, homology. Now notice I'm, I'm not using Z here, I'm using Q, so this is sort of the rational Abel Jacobi map. Okay, so I have a map from D cycles, which are homologically trivial into this, this object, which is a torus, which is called the intermediate Jacobian. It is not necessarily an abelian variety. Okay, nevertheless, it's a great use and great importance to study this. Okay, so now uh, we, we say we, whatever cycles these are, we're going to use this Abel Jacobi map to, to study them. Okay, now I, I mentioned Cherisa cycles. What is a Cherisa cycle? They're sort of the most obvious cycles you can make um, uh, using a curve. So take a curve C. Um, then you can embed it into its Jacobian. Uh, that's not canonical. The map from a curve to its Jacobian is not canonical. You have to fix a base point. And if you change the base point, you change the, change the image. So you have the curve somehow or other sitting inside here. Now, this being an abelian variety has endomorphisms. In particular, I can multiply by an integer. That gives me an endomorphism of the Jacobian. And in particular, I can multiply by minus one. So I look at the, the, the endomorphism generated by minus one. I look at its action on C. So it acts on, on points, but it also acts on cycles. So here's the cycle C that it has, has already been embedded in Jack C. And I look at the action of minus one. And it turns out whether I'm dealing with C or minus one star C in homology, they look the same. Therefore, this, the difference is homologically trivial. And that's good because we said we're looking at homologically trivial cycles. So this is the Cherisa cycle. It's a homologically trivial cycle. Now, remember, we had this chain uh, here, homologically trivial, algebraically trivial, rational trivial. And you, for free, you constructed an element here. And you want to know, does it already live here? Is it algebraically trivial? Or does it already live here? Is it rational trivial? Our main theorem is going to say that, in fact, 
it is not only is it not rationally trivial, but, but its image in this module of this is of infinite order. However, our theorem doesn't allow us to say whether it lives in here. So it could well be algebraically trivial. Okay, so this Chiriza cycle is homologically trivial. Chiriza showed in 1983 that generically, if I pick a curve in the moduli space of, of curves of a fixed genus, if I pick a genus bigger than three, if I pick a general curve, it is not algebraically trivial. But if I give you a specific curve, it turns out to be it's a very hard problem to say whether it's algebraically trivial, whether the Chiriza cycle is algebraically trivial or not. But in any case, the Chiriza cycle is a non-trivial element of, of Chow 1, HOM, Chow 1 Jacobian of C, HOM. In other words, homologically trivial one cycles on the Jacobian modular rational equivalent. And what we want to do is we want to prove it's of infinite order in the case that the curve is the Fermat curve of degree P. Okay, that's what we're trying to do. It's an open question whether it's of infinite order if I mod out by algebraically uh, trivial cycles. Okay. In fact, we don't even know in general, I don't think it's even known um, whether it is um, non-zero. In other words, is, it is, is this cycle algebraically trivial? We don't know that. Okay, so what was known, it's a good segue to this, Bruno Harris showed that for the Fermat curve of degree four, so x to the four plus y to the four equals z to the four, this Chiriza cycle is not algebraically trivial. Then a, a year later, Spencer Block showed that in fact, for this particular cycle, it's, it's actually infinite. It's not only not algebraically trivial, but it's of infinite order module algebraic equivalence. More recently, Otsubo showed by explicit calculation that for n less than or equal to 1,000, the Chiriza cycle is not algebraically trivial. Now to prove our theorem, what we're going to do, it turns out we, we, a lot of pieces are already there, but I think maybe the novel thing in what we're going to do that, that isn't present in the earlier works of uh, Bruno Harris and Otsubo and others is to introduce more arithmetic. So we're going to combine the analytic results of uh, Harris on harmonic volume together with arithmetic results of Gross and Rorlich on points of infinite order on the Jacobian that I, one that I already mentioned to you earlier as well as the analog of the Mann and Rinfeld theorem that Rohrlich proved for, for JP. So using those two, we're going to show that um, the Chiriza cycle on FP is of infinite order mod, is homologically trivial and infinite order modular rational equivalence. Okay, there, there are a bunch of steps and I see that I have only 15 minutes left. So I'm going to um, go, well, we'll see, we'll get as far as we go. And so, as I said, I'm not getting into uh, detail. This is an overview. So first thing is you take the Chiriza cycle and you hit it with the Abel Jacobi map, you end up in the intermediate Jacobian uh, JH3 uh, of, uh, of uh, H3 of the Jacobian of C. And so what we're going to show is because my, my Abel Jacobi map is defined with, with Q coefficients instead of Z coefficients, it's enough for me to show that the image is non-zero here. Now there's a theorem of Carlson that allows us, as you'll see, by the way, as we go through this, it, it really, this, this argument or this, this whole subject seems to involve a really beautiful interplay of lots of tools. So right now we're going to go next into mixed hard structures. So there's a theorem of Carlson that allows us to interpret elements of this uh, intermediate Jacobian in terms of extensions, extensions in the category of mixed hard structures. So in general, what he says is that if H is a hard structure of weight 2D plus one, then uh, when you take the, this intermediate Jacobian of H duo, you can think of it as the X group of H uh, by the uh, Tate motive, Q of minus T. So in particular, if you apply this to um, H being H upper three Jacobian, which is the dual of H lower three Jacobian, remember Abel Jacobi is taking the Chiriza cycle to the inter this uh, intermediate Jacobian H lower three, but it's the dual of H upper three, and then you apply Carlson's theorem. So you see that this thing here is an X group of H upper three Jacobian of C Q minus one. Okay, so there's extensions in the category of rational mixed hard structures. Okay, then step three is that this H upper three, well, it's an, a Jacobian C is an abelian variety, so its cohomology is the exterior algebra on H1. So H upper three is exterior three of H1. And then the H1 of the, of the Jacobian is the same as H1 of the curve, so I have exterior three of H1 C. 
Now, this, uh, if we look at this um, a, the exterior three of H1, that is a sum end inside the tensor triple product of H1 of the curve, of course, because uh, this is, um, this is a, you know, a, a linear combination of tensors, so it lives in here. Now, this space can be decomposed uh, into two subspaces. One is um, H1 times the class of the diagonal uh, living inside here, and then um, H uh, of C cross C, and then H1 cross the rest. Now, it turns out what's left over is a space which is kernel of cup product. Cup product takes H1 tensor H1 to H2, and this is the kernel of cup product. So this space can be decomposed into these two spaces. And we have a, a natural um, surjective map from um, this part here. I'm looking at this part here, um, H1 tensor H1 tensor H1 prime to uh, exterior cube H1. Where, where does this come from? This just comes from the projection of uh, the tensor cube of H1 onto this sum end restricted to this subspace. And that gives me an injection of the, the uh, intermediate Jacobian of, of the dual of this into the intermediate Jacobian of this. Why do I want that? Because remember where I landed up here, the Abel Jacobi map took me first from uh, the Chariza cycle into here, and then from here into JH3, uh, JH uh, upper three um, dual. Here, it's here. And uh, now I want to project onto this piece here. Okay, so by, now by Carlson again, I'm going to apply again this intermediate Jacobian of this Hodge structure is, is again written as an extension group uh, of this kernel of cup product with H1. Okay, now it might be not clear to me why we're doing these kind of manipulations and maybe whether we're, we're making this more and more abstract, but actually it's, it's really remarkable how, how things connect here. Uh, work of Harris and Pulte um, identify the Abel Jacobi image of the series cycle as an extension class. In other words, they tell you which extension class, this, this general stuff that using Carlson's theorem already gives it to you as an extension class, but they identify which extension class it is. So if you consider a smooth complex projective curve and you choose two fixed base points, E and infinity, um, I should tell you, okay, so there you can, one can look at the, the fundamental group of this curve with base point at E. And you look at the group ring on that fundamental group and look at the augmentation ideal. Augmentation ideal means whenever you have a group ring, you can take the degree map to Z and, and the kernel of that is called the augmentation ideal. Now I can look at powers of that augmentation ideal and I can like take the quotients, in fact, I mod I to the N plus one if I want, but here I just took I mod I cubed. Now it turns out that uh, I mod I cubed, I mod I to the N in, in the dual can be um, described in terms of iterated integral. This is the work of Chen. So using this, um, Richard Hain this defined the, a mixed Hodge structure on I mod I cubed dual. So let's call that one on this particular one. Let's give that a name. Let's call it L2 CE. Okay, as we heard in uh, Ram's talk yesterday, it's the, what is it? The game, game of the name. So naming something is, is very important. So this, this uh, mixed Hodge structure uh, fits into this kind of sequence. It, it's an extension of, of H1 tensor H1 prime by H1, and, and this particular extension is connected to the image of the Chiriza cycle under the Abel Jacobi map. Okay. Now, so far, this is not, this is not restricted to the Fermat curve. This applies to any smooth projective curve. Okay. Now, step five is to look at look more carefully at this extension, and also another extension which we call E sub E super infinity where we puncture the curve. In fact, this work on uh, pi one um, started, I guess, probably by Deline in, in the MSRI uh, lectures uh, and then pursued by others is, is about pi one, a punctured curve. So you puncture it, you remove a point and you again get an extension, which looks like this. Um, so you have two extensions, E sub E and E sub E infinity. And it turns out what, what the one we're interested in is E sub E, but the one we can work with is E sub E infinity. Okay, now we restrict to the Fermat curve. So, so far we had not restricted the Fermat curve. Now we restricted the Fermat curve and we require E and infinity to be cusps, in other words, points at infinity. 
Okay, so as I already told you, if I take for Z the graph of this automorphism, X, Y, Z goes to minus Y, Z, X, then its intersection with the diagonal gives you exactly these points that Gross and Rohrlich were looking at, Q and Q bar. So the intersection with the diagonal is Q plus Q bar. And uh, if you, if you, so that's a certain divisor. You see this, this Z is a, is a curve on FP cross FP. P. FP is a curve, FP cross FP is a surface, and this is one dimensional. Again, that is a curve, and I'm intersecting it with another curve, namely the diagonal, so I will get a, a zero cycle, a set of points. So here are the two points. Now I, I zero, I make the degree of the zero by subtracting out the degree uh, and rooted at E. So I get a point which by the gross Rolick theorem is of infinite order in the Jacobian. Moreover, we have a map that connects um, this. Um, this extension with uh, well, a little bit of calculation here, uh, this, this, this extension E sub E infinity, the one with the punctured curve, um, it connects it with a linear combination uh, of a cuspidal divisor and this point P. Okay, this calculation, I'm sorry if I didn't write it down, is due to Dormon, Rutgers, and Sols in their work on trying to find higher dimensional versions of uh, Hegner points. Now, by, by Rohrlich's Mann and Rinfeld theorem, this is, a, this is torsion, as long as we choose both infinity and e to be cusps. And, this is of, and by gross Rohrlich, this is of infinite order, which means that e, this extension is of infinite order. On the other hand, uh, work of Cantor's shows that the other piece of it is H, in H1 tensor psi delta. That is, in fact, um, the image here is supported on, on, at the cusps. And therefore, the difference between E sub E and E sub infinity is a finite order. And therefore, E sub E is also of infinite order. Now, the above calculation assumed that E is a cusp. Uh, the, the extension class, uh, this thing here, depends on E. So we just need to do a little bit of calculation to, to free this from this restriction. And here we use a result of Bruno Harris who shows that the restriction of the abel jacobi map to primitive cohomology is in fact independent of the base point. So restricting to primitive, and on the other hand, you can do a calculation to say what, what happens when you restrict to primitive cohomology, you actually adjust, adjust it by this psi delta, which we've already seen has image uh, finite, uh, uh, which is a finite order. So that's how, that's basically the steps of the proof. Um, and so you get that uh, this um, e, e infinity is of infinite order, which means this extension class is of infinite order. And if you go back to um, um, this, this thing here, this is of infinite order by, Pult by Harris and Pulte, and therefore this is of infinite order as well. So that's how the, the theorem is proved in a, in a nutshell. Now I have a few minutes left, so I'll just talk about um, further thoughts. What about, we, we talked about the Fermat curve at prime degree, what about composite N? Well, it's a small additional argument, you get the following strengthening of the main result. Uh, suppose N has a prime divisor bigger than seven, then the Chiriza cycle is of infinite order modular rational equivalence. So you can, you can project, if, if N has a prime divisor bigger than seven, you can actually project the Chiriza cycle here to the Chiriza cycle on the corresponding um, Jacobian of F sub P there for this prime. And here's the previous step, okay. Second point is we, we proved infinite order modulo rational equivalence. What about algebraic equivalence? So this is a pretty hard theorem, but it's extremely interesting and uh, um, I don't have any ideas on it. But in cases where it has been shown that the Chiriza cycle is non-trivial modulo algebraic equivalence, forget about infinite order. And, and you've shown that it's non-trivial modulo algebraic equivalence. It was through explicit computation of Bruno Harris's uh, harmonic volume. And it turns out that volume, which I didn't really define for you, is, is, is shown to be a special value of a generalized hypergeometric function. And you have to show that that value is non-integral. And you can do that numerically in, in a given case. That's why Otsubo was able to show this non-triviality for Fermat curves up to degree 1,000. But whether, um, but, but you, I don't see how to, how to get a general result from that. And I also don't see how we, those methods can be refined to show infinite order modular algebraic equivalence. I, I wish uh, that we, our methods would be able to do that, but I, at the moment, I don't see how to do that either, but that's really where we want to go. And finally, a word about L functions. Um, what does this mean in terms of the block balance and conjecture? Because we've just constructed an element of infinite order 
in the, the Chow group of um, homologically trivial cycles. And so what um, the prediction would be is that, um, the prediction would be is that, uh, let's say, so we have one cycle of infinite order in the Chow group of JP for P begins seven. Um, this cycle, um, I, I didn't check this, but it's probably true. It actually will live in one of the quotient curves because you saw how we, how we did it. We used those points, um, uh, Q plus Q inverse that uh, Q bar rather, uh, and those points we saw lived in the quotient curves. So probably we can do, we can show that the image of the series of cycle here in this Chow group is already infinite order. Now the Jacobian of this thing has dimension half T minus one, as I said, and Block Balenson will ask about the co-dimension this because we constructed one cycle, so it has co-dimension this. So it would say that in the Chow half T minus one minus one of the, the Jacobian of CS, um, um, the dimension of that space, it should be the order of zero of the L function of the H P minus four L function of the Jacobian at this point. So if I, if I do some duality, it should probably translate into, the, let's say, let's take a special case, P equals 11. It, uh, the Jacobian here of CS has dimension five. 11 minus one is 10 over two, five. Block Balenson will, will say something about the H seven L function of that Jacobian at, at the point four, should, it should be the dimension of um, um, core dimension four cycles, which are homologically trivial. By duality, and again, I didn't check the duality, but I think this is true. Uh, we can replace this with H3 of the curve at S equals two. So the theorem is saying uh, the block balance and conjecture plus our theorem will, will predict this has to be bigger than or equal to one. Well, the L functions of these Fermat curves and the, the Jacobians are well known. They're given in terms of Hecke characters. And so we should be able to check whether it vanishes or not. Assuming we have the correct numbers here, we should be able to check whether there's an obvious reason that this L function vanishes at S equals two. Um, I have no idea. I mean, of course, um, the, the uh, optimist in me would be saying that, oh, there might be something interesting in here, but uh, then we have maybe just caution ourselves that if it vanishes, it might be for an obvious reason. Maybe there's a root number consideration or something like that. I don't know. I've not checked that. So that's, that's where we are. That's, I think, all I wanted to say. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you for the nice talk. Are there any questions or comments? Uh, I have a question. Um, I have a question? Yeah, sure. Uh, so, um, so does your, are there conjectures about the Mordell way rank of the Jacobian of the Fermat curve? Well, I mean, there is how it grows. Oh, how it grows? No, you mean you talk no, like upper yeah. bounds? Yeah, I, I think bounds. the only lower bounds we have are um, based on these results of Gross and Rohrlich. I, I, I hope I'm not missing something in the literature, but I don't think anybody has actually looked to see is it just rank one or is it more you can get? Is it just this one point of infinite order or more? I don't know. So that's a good thing. You should try to do more of a descent on the, on the Jacobian of CS. And then in your last uh, slide, you had uh, this uh, L function and you were saying that if you just check the root numbers, maybe that's a good thing to start from where if you check the root numbers and then yeah. the root number is minus one, and that should give you the, what the rank should be, right? I mean, At least it'll give you the parity. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, but usually you don't have high order zeros too many times. And therefore, that will probably be pretty close to the rank. Maybe, but we're out of the domain of curves now. We're not in dealing with elliptic curves anymore. So I'm not oh. sure if, if that philosophy still works or not. I don't know. Maybe you're right. I don't know. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. So I have a question. I think it's related to the first question. Was is there a, does one expect a gross zaggy kind of formula for with these uh, series of cycles? Yeah, I would love to be able to say yes, but of course it's way, way, way too early to know. I mean, it's, it, but I mean, look, the, the point is you have a sort of canonically constructed cycle. And so if, if, if life were good, then yes, it should be, it should play a role in telling you something about the leading term. 
Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's probably, I don't know of any calculations towards that. I mean, one would need to know, I guess, the order of vanishing, like uh, all the all the vanishing yeah. comes from your cycles. So. Exactly, exactly. And it might not be that inaccessible because they are these are uh, well-known L functions. There are L functions of hacker characters, but they're particular hacker characters that uh, we can write down. I guess it's probably Jacobi some hacker characters. And so it's possible we can understand the, the uh, L function. So it's, it's, anyway, it's worth looking at. Okay. Uh, are there any other questions or comments? Uh, I, I sort of had a basic question. So um, instead of, um, so if we take X, so here um, uh, for your talk, you had uh, talked about uh, Fermat curve. So instead of the Fermat curve, if we take some yes, familiar uh, variety, for instance, some parabola, some easy uh, thing. So what do all these statements reduce to? Uh, uh, sorry, what, what do you take? Uh, so instead of so for a, uh, as x, if we take some um, uh, some variety, suppose like some parabola or something like that. Oh, instead of a Fermat curve, you take a rational curve. Yeah. Yeah. The problem is a rational so curve. In that case, yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, so I was just wondering what do all these uh, statements uh, reduce to in those cases? Yeah, the problem in the rational curve is that uh, the Jacobian is zero. Um, so everything is rationally, so when you look at um, uh, divisors, modulo, principal divisors, everything is principal. You can always find a rational function, any divisor of degree zero. So the Jacobian disappears. So see, theory, theory only starts with positive genus curves. That's why I said, you know, the Jacobian, the dimension of the Jacobian is the genus of the curve. So if the genus is zero, the Jacobian is zero. I see. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. All right. So, if there are no further questions, let let's thank uh, Professor Murthy again. Thank you for the wonderful. Okay. Thank you, Professor Kumar Murthy and Professor Mahesh. And the next session is preliminary talk number nine by Professor Douglas B. West at 1945 Indian time. The same link. 
い。Hello, sir. Is it okay? Okay. Okay. It's fine. I entered. Okay. Okay. Yeah. No. Can you please uh, share the screen? Okay. How's that? Let 
into the Hello, Doug. Hello. This is Manoj. Hi, how are you? Yeah, doing fine. How are you? Good, good. Yeah, nice I just to want to. Yeah. I, I was seeing you. I was viewing your, your face, but I could not talk to you. So I just asked Vijay to unmute me to just say hello to you. Uh huh. Well, hello to you. Hello to everybody. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Hungarians have arrived.
Hi, Sebi. Yeah. Shall starts in two minutes. Okay. okay. Okay, welcome to the plenary talk number nine by Professor Douglas West. I invite Professor Armukham, a senior professor at uh, Palasilingam University and uh, adjunct professor at Ball State University, USA, to chair this session and introduce the speaker. Professor Armukham. 
So thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here with you in this ICN TDM to chair the session of Professor Douglas P. West, who is at present Professor of Maths at Jijiang Normal University and also Professor Emeritus at the University of Illinois at Urbana Champaign. We know him very well. All graph theorists know him through his fantastic book on introduction to graph theory. Now it's very nice that he has added another book to this list on combinatorial mathematics. And I'm sure that we shall start using his next book as we are using his first book. So I'm very happy to invite Professor West to his talk on reconstruction of graphs, one of the most famous unsolved problems in graph theory. First proposed, proposed by Ulam and then reformulated by Harari. The problem still remains unsolved. Let us hope to see what's the status of the problem as on today. So I invite Professor West to present his talk on reconstruction of graphs. Professor West. Thank you very much for the introduction and the invitation. And thank all of you for uh, staying up so late or getting up so early, depending on what hemisphere you're in, uh, to listen to my talk. Um, let me note uh, first that the slides for this talk are available at the top of my preprint page, and so you can peruse them at your leisure. I'd like to tell you about uh, several papers that are on this topic of reconstruction. Um, the first one joint with my former student, Hannah Spinoza, and then several recent papers with Sasha Kostochka and his students, Mina Navi and Dara Tserlin. So, uh, oh. I think we're not all graph theorists here. So let me begin with a question from matrices. Is it true that a symmetric matrix, that the isomorphism class of a symmetric matrix is determined by the isomorphism types of its principal submatrices? Um, by isomorphism type, I mean that simultaneous permutation of the rows and columns is allowed. Well, when you think about this, it's uh, not, uh, it doesn't take long to see that this problem is the hardest when all the entries just take one of two values and the diagonal is constant. And so if we turn those two values into zero and one and make the diagonal, uh, the constant on the diagonal be zero, then these become just the adjacency matrices of graphs. And the principal submatrices correspond to the induced subgraphs. So the problem that we have uh, for matrices in, in general here reduces to the classical reconstruction problem in graph theory. So now let's talk about graphs. Here's the, the classical problem of reconstruction. We say that a card of a graph is an induced subgraph that we get by deleting one vertex and the deck of a graph is the multiset of its cards. So for example, here's a graph with four vertices and the four vertices that we can get by deleting one vertex are right here. On the other hand, if someone gives you these four induced subgraphs, you can reconstruct what this graph was. So how do we do that? Well, look at one of these triangles. We have to add one vertex and by symmetry, the only question is how many vertices we should make it adjacent to. Well, since we have another triangle, we have to make it adjacent to at least two of these vertices. And on the other hand, since we have an induced subgraph like this, we cannot make it adjacent to all three. So uh, this deck determines this graph. So this is our problem in general, the reconstruction conjecture, famous conjecture by Kelly and Ulam is that any graph with at least three vertices is determined by its deck in this way. Now, actually the conjecture appeared 15 years earlier in Kelly's thesis in 1942. So the problem is almost 80 years old and we do not know whether this is true. 
There have been many surveys on the topic, survey papers, all of these having to do with uh, all kinds of aspects. Um, we know that various classes of graphs, uh, the graphs in various classes are reconstructable. Uh, we know there are various uh, parameters or properties of the graph that we can reconstruct from the deck. Um, so what do mathematicians do when they are faced with a, a problem that they can't solve? Well, uh, we all know what we do is we define a harder problem. So let's think about that. Um, in the example that I've given you, to reconstruct this graph, I only used these three cards. I didn't need the second card isomorphic to a path. On the other hand, it matters which three cards that I used, because if I use these three instead, it does not determine this graph. And there's another graph, which is the triangle with one pendant edge that has these three same cards in its deck. So this suggests a parameter uh, introduced by Harari and Platthold in 1985, the reconstruction number of a graph is the least number of cards that we need to determine the graph. So we don't know that it's always doable, but we can at least think about how hard it is to reconstruct a graph by thinking about how many numbers that you, uh, how many cards that you need to determine the graph. So this is a more detailed look at reconstruction. So what do we know about reconstruction numbers? Uh, there are a number of things. Merval proved that the reconstruction number is three for uh, disconnected graphs when you have nine isomorphic components. It's also three for all trees with at least five vertices. And uh, in fact, it's three for almost all graphs. Uh, and uh, on the other hand, the reconstruction number is not always three. It can be larger. Uh, if you have a complete uh, multipartite graph with R vertices in each part, or uh, similarly the union of uh, cliques with R vertices, disjoint union, uh, then the reconstruction number will be R plus two. Uh, this illustrates that um, the reconstruction number or reconstruction question about any graph is equivalent to the question for the complement because if you know the deck, you also know the deck of complementary graphs, which are the deck of the complement. Uh, okay, so in, in particular, if you look at the balanced complete partite graph, all of its cards are the same and uh, that card also shows up n over two plus one times as a card of this slightly unbalanced graph. So in order to distinguish these two graphs, you will need to have at least n over two pl plus two cards. Uh, and Harari and Plantot in fact conjectured that this is the maximum of the reconstruction number for n vertex graphs achieved only by uh, the balanced bipartite graph and its complement when n is bigger than four. Um, there's been, there were a lot of papers, so, I mean, okay, if you can't determine the reconstruction number of, the, of a graph, uh, what can you tell about the graph? Again, this kind of question. A uh, number of papers were written just about the number of cards that are needed to reconstruct the number of edges that the graph has. And um, a recent work on this was uh, uh, said that, well, you can at least toss away some uh, square root n cards when n is large and be able from the remainder to uh, determine the number of edges. Okay, but this is not the topic I want to talk about. I want to talk about a different approach to studying how hard it is to reconstruct a graph. So this was actually introduced by Kelly. Kelly conjectured that for any natural number L, there is some threshold, M sub L, so that all graphs with 
at least that many vertices will be reconstructable from the deck of cards that you get by deleting L vertices instead of just one vertex. Okay, so this is a more general conjecture than the reconstruction conjecture. Um, uh, and we, we call that being L reconstructable, if you can determine the graph from uh, the deck obtained by deleting L vertices. So the original reconstruction conjecture is just that M sub one is equal to three, that when you just delete one vertex and take all those subgraphs, that if your graph has at least three vertices, you'll be able to reconstruct it from the deck. It's thought that M sub two is six. And this would be sharp when you think about these two graphs, a four cycle plus an isolated vertex, or a claw where you subdivide one edge, these two have the same three deck, the deck of three vertex induced subgraphs. So uh, that means you're deleting two vertices. So these graphs are not too reconstructable because they have the same three deck. So I use the term K deck uh, is the set or multi-set rather of K vertex induced subgraphs. And the reason why this conjecture uh, is reasonable to think about and, and of interest is the simple observation that the K deck of a graph determines its K minus one deck. That's quite easy to see because each graph in the K minus one deck arises exactly N minus K plus one times by deleting one vertex from a graph in the K deck. So if you take the graphs in the K deck and you look at everything you can get by deleting one more vertex and just group them N minus K plus one at a time, you will obtain the K minus one deck. So that means that the sensible aim in studying how hard it is to reconstruct the graph, we want to find the least K such that our graph is reconstructable from the K deck. Or equivalently, this is the same as talking about it being L reconstructable if K plus L equals the number of vertices. And as I said, this is another way to think about how hard it is to reconstruct a graph. So what do we know about this problem? So a simple example that appears in uh, my paper with Spinoza uh, is if you take a path with two L vertices and you take another graph, which is the disjoint union of a cycle with L plus one vertices and a path with L minus one vertices, these two graphs have the same L deck. So the threshold for L reconstructability of N vertex graphs has to be bigger than 2L. So we'll see this example again in various ways. The uh, uh, theorem proved by Needle is that actually if you fix some positive number epsilon, there are arbitrarily large graphs that are not epsilon and reconstructable where ends the number of vertices of the graph. And this means that actually this threshold M sub L will have to grow at least super linearly. Um, okay. And another observation that you can make from this example is that if you're deleting half the vertices, you're not even guaranteed to be able to tell whether the graph that you started with is connected or not. Okay. Uh, so let's think about small values of L. Uh, in fact, you can, if you are uh, talking about deleting two vertices, you can tell whether the original graph was connected or not. You can also tell what its degree list is when the number of vertices is at least six. Okay. Uh, and the example that I showed you earlier shows that the threshold is sharp because this one is connected, this is not, and they have different degree lists, but they only have five vertices. Um, 
thinking again about the degree list, uh, Taylor proved a more general result that the degree list of your graph is L reconstructable. In other words, you take the deck of, of, multi, of subgraphs you get by deleting L vertices. And if you're given that, you will be able to tell what the degree list of your graph was if N is at least roughly E times L. Um, and this is not sure, but we don't know the precise threshold here. Uh, so here's the degree list. What about connectedness? So Spinoza and I showed that whether the graph is connected is L reconstructable when N is at least some rather large threshold in terms of L. Um, this is very surely not sharp. Um, again, when we think about small L, uh, Kostochka and his students and I uh, proved that connectedness and the degree list are both three reconstructable when n is at least seven. Now, and remember that the two deck tells you the three deck. So if you know this result, that implies the results up here about two reconstructability, um, as long as you check out the graphs with six vertices. So in general, when you prove something is uh, L reconstructable, that's a stronger result than showing that it's L minus one reconstructable. Uh, and this result is also sharp. If we take a five cycle with an isolated vertex and we take a claw and subdivide two edges, then they will have the same three deck. And these are six vertex graphs. Okay. Um, some more results. Well, uh, as I observed on the previous slide, we can't tell whether a graph is connected if we have uh, only the deck with uh, subgraphs having half of the vertices. But if we have, if we delete a little bit less than half, then almost every graph is going to be reconstructable from the deck that we get. And in fact, we will only need L plus two choose two of the cards. And I will say some more about this later. Uh, and this generalizes the classical result for the ordinary reconstruction problem when L equals one that said that almost every graph is reconstructable or one reconstructable. Um, what else do we know? Well, about graphs with maximum degree at most two, we know everything. We know exactly all L for which such a graph is L reconstructable. And the largest L is always going to be at least N minus one over two. So in fact, that example that I showed you earlier, of the path with two L vertices compared with the cycle and the path union uh, is sharp. Uh, it shows the sharpness of this. Um, and what about trees? One of the earliest results about reconstruction, a result by Kelly, was showing that trees are one reconstructable. And uh, the needle produced uh, trees with two L vertices, two different trees that have the same L deck. Uh, this is when L is bigger than two. So the example that I showed you, I, I, I mentioned taking a claw and subdividing two edges. If you take that claw and instead subdivide one edge twice, you get a different tree, but they have the same three deck. Those are graphs with six vertices and they have the same three deck. Um, okay, but now when we're thinking about trees, and trying to say, is this sharp? Um, we want to know uh, whether or not, be able to tell whether or not the uh, uh, graph is acyclic. And in fact, um, about a week ago, we proved that if n is at least 2L plus 3, then we be, will be able to recognize from uh, the n minus L deck 
whether the graph contains an, a cycle or not. And we expect that soon we'll be able to push this down to n being at least 2L plus 1, which by, uh, not this example, but the other example uh, would be sharp. So the natural conjecture then is that trees with at least 2L plus 1 vertices are L reconstructible, which would be sharp. So again, what about small l? Uh, we've been able to show uh, that trees with at least, I think it's 22 vertices, are three reconstructable. And there's a little number over here, 64. That's the number of pages in the proof of this result. We have a very long proof that uh, trees with at least 22 vertices are three reconstructed. Um, but the answer should be seven. Okay, uh, a couple of other results. Uh, uh, Sasha Kostochka and I wrote a, a survey paper that came out this year. One of the results in there is that if you have a graph where all components have at most n minus L vertices, then the graph is L reconstructible. So, this actually generalizes uh, uh, Kelly's result that disconnected graphs are one reconstructable. But the interesting thing about this result is that if you think about graphs where all the components have at most n minus l plus one vertex and, well, uh, sorry, it has one component with n minus l plus one vertices and all the other vertices are isolated. If such graphs are L reconstructible, then the original reconstruction conjecture is true. So uh, this is another relationship or, uh, where L reconstructability or questions about L reconstructability can uh, inform what we know about the, uh, the classical question. Uh, one other result. Um, so it's one of the first things you learn when you study reconstruction is that regular graphs are one reconstructable. This is a very easy result because uh, since we know the n minus one deck, we know the two decks. So we know the number of edges. So we can look at any card and know how many edges are incident to the missing vertex. Okay, so that means we know the degree list. We know the graph is regular. And if the graph is regular, then when we look at any card, the missing vertex has to be adjacent to the deficient vertices. So it's very easy to reconstruct a regular graph. So I talked about this problem uh, and Boyan Mohar asked, well, are regular graphs too reconstructable? And the problem, as soon as you go to deleting two vertices, is that, okay, yes, you can see these deficient vertices and you know the graph is regular, but you have no way to tell uh, easily which of the deficient vertices are adjacent to which of the missing vertices. But, uh, okay, so we were able to show that three regular graphs are two reconstructed. So as you can see here, there's a, some amount that's known, but there are many, many questions that remain open. So what I'd like to do in the remaining time is uh, show you some of the ideas that go into proving some of these results. And um, if you get lost, well, you can take a short nap and in a couple of minutes, I'll be talking about another result. So you can come back in. Uh, and remember these slides are available on my preprint page, so you can uh, look it over again at your leisure. So let's start, warm up with uh, some easy questions about complete multi-part type graphs. So Manvel proved that if you have the deck, if you have maximum degree K, and you have the deck of K plus two vertex induced subgraphs, then you can determine the degree list. You can see, because there are no dominating vertices in any of your cards, 
you can see what the maximum degree is. And then counting arguments tells you how many vertices there are with each smaller degree. Well, how do we make use of that? If you have a complete R part type graph where all the part sizes are at most M, then that graph will be determined by the M plus one depth. Again, that means that there's no other graph that has the same M plus one depth. How do we show that? Well, because we know the M plus one deck, we know the three deck. And then we see that the path with three vertices is not an induced subgraph of the complement. Well, that's the same thing as G being a complete multi-part type graph. And once we know that G is a complete multi-part type graph, all we need to know is the degree list. So, um, since the maximum degree in the complement will be less than M, Mandel's result enables us to reconstruct the degree list, which determines uh, the graph what, now that we know that it's complete multi part time. A little bit more interesting is that if we have a complete R part type graph, so now we're fixing the number of parts, but we don't care how big the parts are, that is going to be determined by the R plus one depth. Again, the same argument tells us we have a complete multi-part type graph. And since we have the R plus one deck, we can see that there's no complete graph with R plus one vertices. So we know our complete multi-part type graph is R part. So now all we need to do is determine the sizes of the parts. So let me do something a little bit algebraic here. The part sizes are some unknowns, Q1 through QR. And let me make a polynomial for the graph then where the, the roots are the sizes of the parts. If we expand out this polynomial, then the coefficient of x to the r minus one times minus one to the i is just the sum of products of i choices from these part sizes. And what is that equal? Well, that's just precisely the number of complete subgraphs with i vertices, it's the number of cards in the i deck that are complete. So since we know the r plus one deck, we know the i deck, we determine what these coefficients are. So we know the polynomial and we can find the integer zeros. Okay. Uh, what about almost all graphs? So reconstructing almost all graphs is based on an observation about the induced subgraphs with uh, more than half of the vertices, basically. And the property that they have when you have very large subgraphs of very large graphs is that uh, those induced subgraphs have no non-trivial automorphism and they're pairwise non-isomorphic. Uh, this is a the basic result about random graphs and it almost always means the fraction as n goes to infinity that have this property uh, tends to one. So uh, the theorem we prove is that if the subgraphs that you get by deleting L plus one vertices have this nice property, no non-trivial automorphisms and pairwise non-isomorphic, then G will be reconstructable from some set of just L plus two choose two subgraphs that are obtained by deleting L vertices. And the corollary then is that uh, the fraction of N vertex graphs that will be reconstructable from the subgraphs obtained by deleting, again, almost half of the vertices will tend to one as N tends to infinity. So let me uh, just sketch which cards in the deck we use to do this. Um, again, this, this, the theorem that we're uh, trying to prove is that when we delete L, uh, sorry, the N minus L minus one vertex induced subgraphs, if they have this good property, then the N minus L deck will determine the graph. So we're gonna be deleting L vertices. So what do we do? Let's fix L plus one special vertices Okay, in the set S. And here H is the subgraph induced by the remaining vertices. 
we need to make cards where we delete only L vertices. So we'll delete L of these L plus one special vertices. So one of our cards, we'll keep one vertex here and the rest of the vertices down here, okay? That'll give us L plus one cards, but each of those cards has only one of these vertices up here. So there's no way they could tell us whether any two of these vertices up here are adjacent or not. So we're going to have an additional L plus one choose two cards where we keep two of these vertices, but then because we want to throw away L altogether, we'll have to throw away one vertex down here. Okay, and so the claim is that when we take these L plus one cards and these L plus one choose two, together we'll be able to determine what the graph is using this property. And the idea is just that that special vertex H is the only subgraph with H vertices that will appear in L plus one of the cards that we have uh, selected. And that way we can tell what H is, what all those special cards is, what these vertices are, the edges from there to there. <clears throat> well, why is this true? Um, it's easy, you just have to check the possibilities for how many vertices in the special set your graph with H vertices uses there's just a few cases to check. I won't say anything about those cases. And then once you've done that, you know this subgraph, you can also identify uh, the card that enables you to tell whether Xi and Xj are adjacent. Okay, so this is not a hard result. What about connectedness? Well, I want to show you that connectedness is L reconstructible when N is large. So let's let C of D be the number of cards in the deck that are connected. And we suppose that we have a connected graph and a disconnected graph that have the same N minus L. Well, how could this happen? Since G is connected, there has to be at least one connected card. So that means that H will, since it also has the same deck, we'll have to have a component with at least n minus L vertices. Okay, if that component has exactly n minus P vertices, P is less than or equal to L, then um, the number of connected cards that H will have is going to be, well, you have to keep only vertices from that uh, large component and you will throw away L minus P of them in addition to the P vertices you threw away outside the card. So we have, uh, okay. And meanwhile, this graph H will also give us a lower bound on the number of cards having a small component, order at most L. So we can just keep some special vertex outside the big component and then pick L other vertices, throw away, that all of those cards will have a small component. So from H, we got an upper bound on the number of connected cards and a lower bound on the number of cards with a small component. We're going to use this G that's connected to get a lower bound on the number of connected cards and an upper bound on the number of cards having a small component. Together, all these inequalities will lead us to an upper bound on N. And um, what we actually do when we study this connected graph is consider a spanning tree of the connected graph and look at its N minus L deck. And the thing you can observe is that if you have a set of vertices that give you a connected card in the spanning tree T, it will also give you a connected card in G because G just has more edges than the spanning tree. And similarly, if you have a card in G that has a small component, using the same vertices will give you a card in T that has a small component because you just threw away edges. So actually we get these uh, bounds that we need by getting a lower bound on the number of connected cards of the spanning tree and an upper bound 
on the number of cards with small component in the spanner tree. So that's just a brief flavor uh, of how you approach this problem. Uh, you assume you have two graphs that disagree on the property that you're interested in, and then you try to find a contradiction. So let me skip all this about the computations here, which I wasn't going to show you completely anyway. There's some appendices at the end of these slides uh, about things that I'm not telling you about. So <laughs> you can find out more by looking at the slides that I have on the web. Um, instead, let's go on to another uh, problem. We're still 10 minutes behind. The degree list. How do we show that this is three reconstructible? Well, consider the number of vertices that have uh, degree i. Let a sub i be that. And let phi of j be the total over all the cards of the number of vertices you see with degree exactly j in the card. Okay, so a basic lemma that was used by both Mandel and Taylor in their results is that if you are given the k deck, remember L is n minus k, then this quantity phi of j is going to be this interesting sum. What's the argument? Well, if you have a vertex of degree i and it gets counted as having degree j, in some k card, what does that mean? That means the rest of the k card consists of choosing j neighbors of this vertex and k minus one minus j non neighbors of this vertex. So we're just counting all the contributions to this. So suppose we have graphs, g and h. The number of vertices of degree i and g is a sub i, the number of vertices of degree i and h is b sub i. If they have the same k deck, then these numbers phi of j are the same for both graphs. So that means if we subtract the jth equation for g and for h, where c sub i is the difference in the number of vertices of degree i in g and h, we're going to get this equation. And uh, so now the theorem is that in fact, this difference has to be zero for all i, if n is at least seven, and we're talking about three reconstructability. The, the size of the cards is n minus three. Okay, and uh, in fact, to prove this, all we need to do is look at this equation when j is n minus four and n minus five, and consider the largest index where G and H have different numbers of vertices of that degree. There are a few cases to consider um, and uh, you can get the result. Okay. Connectedness is three reconstructible for N at least seven. Well, uh, you know, uh, I think I should probably skip this and, oh no, I have to tell you about this. Okay, again, suppose we have two graphs with M edges. We know how many edges there are because we know the N minus three deck, we know the two deck. Suppose G is connected and H is not. If G is connected, D will have to have at least two connected cards, which means that our disconnected H is gonna have a component that has at least n minus two vertices. Because if it had only n minus three, you couldn't get more than one connected card. The degree list is the same. So we're actually using the previous result about the degree list being three reconstructible. And that means that H will actually look like an isolated edge plus a large component. If there's a vertex of degree one in that large component, then D will have a card Remember, delete three vertices, two vertices of the isolated edge and one vertex C in C that has degree one. So you've lost only two edges. But if you have a connected graph, 
you cannot lose only two edges by deleting three vertices. So that means that G and H both have exactly two vertices of degree one. And then we look at the number of vertices of degree two and similar arguments tell us that the deck has exactly that many cards with M minus three edges. And that allows us to reduce what G has to look like to one of these structures. And uh, if you delete three vertices, you still have a vertex of degree only one. So that tells you something about this component C and H and you get to a contradiction. Okay. Um, three reconstructability of trees. So again, the early result of Kelly said that trees with at least three vertices are one reconstructable. Giles in 1976 showed that trees with at least six vertices are two reconstructable. And now here's our result for three reconstructability. So it's briefly what the key idea is that we make use of in this problem is the idea of reconstructability of rooted trees. So if I have an n vertex rooted tree, there's a distinguished vertex as a root. Um, we say an RCL car is an, we're going to delete L of the vertices to get a rooted subtree that has the same root. So we're just iteratively deleting leaves. RCL means rooted connected card obtained by deleting L vertices. And the theorem we prove is that no two rooted trees will have the same RC3 cards, except for some special exceptions that basically look like a long path with a few vertices at the bottom. The cost of a vertex in a tree is the maximum number of vertices in a component when you delete that vertex. The cost of the tree is the minimum cost among the vertices, and a centroid is a vertex of minimum cost. Well, it's well known, uh, it was used by Merville in her results, that an n-vertex tree has one centroid with cost less than n over two, or has two adjacent centroids, each of which have cost n over two. So it turns out that you can find out about the cost of the tree from the cost of the connected cards in the deck. The, um, if you have, uh, okay, so when we look at the maximum cost among the connected cards in the deck, that's actually going to be equal to the cost of the tree if the cost of the tree is at most n minus L over two. And furthermore, very important that if the cost of the tree is at most n minus L over two, then the centroid of T is actually the centroid or a centroid in every connected card. What that enables us to do is to show very easily that trees with cost at most n minus five are three reconstructable because we can find out the cost from the deck using this lemma. And since each connected card, the centroid is the actual centroid of the reconstructed tree, then the deck gives us, can be interpreted as the RC3 cards of the tree rooted at its centroid. And the rooted result then tells us that the reconstructed tree is unique. So what about the um, uh, remaining trees with larger cost? Well, 46 more pages. Uh, many uses of this idea of rooted reconstruction where we can determine some part of the tree and for the rest of it, we get the RC3 deck and can reconstruct that way. So, um, and, uh, the time is almost out, um, but there's this nice problem I'd like to tell you about. Uh, I don't know. Um, is it possible to have a few more minutes? Yeah. Okay. 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 Uh, so, what about the problem of graphs with maximum degree two? 
here's where we have the most detailed results. Richard Stanley proposed a problem in the problem section of the American Mathematical Monthly in 2016. He said, show that if G is an n-vertex graph whose components are all cycles of length greater than K, then it doesn't matter what the lengths are, the number of independent sets of size K would depend only on N and K. So he presented a proof of this using generating functions. And we were able to find a combinatorial proof and then generalize the combinatorial proof to say something um, much more general that is related to this reconstruction. Namely, that if you have two N vertex graphs with maximum degree two and the same number of edges, as long as every component in each graph is a cycle with more than K vertices, as he was talking about, or a path with at least K minus one vertices, then the two graphs would have the same K depth. So this gives you a lower bound on how many uh, vertices you need to have in the graphs in your deck in order to reconstruct the graph. Because otherwise, you can. so in particular, here are some special cases. It says that if you have two cycles whose length is at least k plus one, or a cycle whose length is the sum of those lengths, they will have the same k depth. If you have the path compared with a cycle and a path, these lower bounds on the lengths, then again, they have the same depth, k depth. That is the class that I mentioned for you back at the beginning, that if we have a path with two L vertices compared with a cycle and a path, then they'll have the same k depth. And finally, if you have two paths and you just shift a vertex from one to the other, so it slightly change the lengths, they have the same k deck as long as you keep each component being at least k plus one vertices. Now, why do I mention these three cases? Because not only are they interesting special cases, but in fact, they are all you need to prove to prove the theorem because of this nice lemma that says that if you have two graphs, they will have the same k deck if and only if their disjoint union with any other graph you want has the same k deck. That means once you get two graphs to share a component, you can forget about it and just test whether the remaining graphs have the same k deck or not. Um, now, to determine everything about the graphs, this just, as I said, gives you a lower bound on how big you need to keep the graphs in the deck. And it turns out that uh, if k is big enough, basically, to avoid the problem on the previous slide, then they will be k-deck reconstructable. Uh, and that size that you need is roughly half the size of the biggest component, or and also at least as big as the next biggest component, with some slight adjustments. I'm not going to tell you anything about that. Um, the I okay, let me just tell you the basic idea about proving these three statements. Yeah, here we have two paths. Okay, as described in number three. So here are our two graphs. What we would like to do when we're counting induced subgraphs is augment these graphs by putting three vertices in the middle here. And so the idea is that if we show that the number of induced copies of a certain subgraph that has a special designated vertex as an isolated vertex, is the same in this graph and this graph, which happen to be the same graph, then uh, we will get what we want about the original G1 and G2 that I showed you. So basically, the idea that we want is that if we look at a path, then this number of cards isomorphic to a particular subgraph that include this guy as an isolated vertex is not going to depend on where this special guy is as long as we keep it far enough from the ends. Um, so that's the basic idea. There's an inductive proof about that and I better not tell you that. 
So let me work towards ending here. I told you there were some appendices at the end of these slides that I'm not going to show you anything about, but they give you some of the ideas in uh, the other half of this resolution of the problem about maximum degree two, that if we have K big enough, we will be able to show that they're reconstructable from the K deck. Uh, second appendix, uh, the ideas in showing that the three regular graphs are too reconstructable. And the third one, um, as I was telling you, um, I mean, there's some reasons why I didn't want to tell you about the details of this upper bound, one of them being that this is clearly much too big. That we would, we, there should be a much better result. So let me finish with uh, some open questions. So first we have um, the big question that uh, conjectured by Kelly and Mandel, as I told you at the beginning, show that there's some threshold so that every graph with at least that many vertices is L reconstructable. Of course, even better figure out what that threshold is. Uh, what about some easier questions, uh, smaller results? How many vertices do we need to guarantee that we can tell whether or not all graphs reconstructable from this deck uh, of deleting L vertices are connected. Maybe this threshold is 2L plus 1. Uh, it's certainly not 2L to the L plus 1 squared. Um, the conjecture I mentioned that all N vertex trees will be L reconstructable when N is at least uh, 2L plus 1. Um, this is for L not equal to 2. I showed you that special example with uh, six vertices that's not too reconstructable. Um, as I was suggesting, we know everything about graphs of maximum degree at most two. Uh, can you extend some of that knowledge to graphs with maximum degree at most three? Can you find, say, the least uh, for, for a given graph G? what is the least k such the k deck will determine it when the graph, if you know that the graph has maximum degree at most three. Or uh, uh, what, what k will be enough for all such graphs with n vertices. Um, okay, let me not mention that. Now here's something interesting. We talked at the beginning about complete multipartite graphs. And I told you that if the part sizes were bounded, then we have a nice bound on how many vertices are needed in the deck to uh, reconstruct. And if we know that it's R part type, so the number of parts is bounded, then again, we have a nice bound. But Needle considered the question of just having, well, equivalences, he called them. In other words, complete multi-partite graphs where neither the part size nor the number of parts is bounded. You just know the number of vertices. So what is the maximum number of vertices and such that every n vertex completely multipartite graph is determined by its k deck. So Needle showed that it's somewhere between k log k and k plus one, two to the k minus one. So this is a, a huge gap here. And if this is a problem that interests you, you might be able to make some nice progress on it. And here's maybe the smallest question uh, on my list here that somebody could pursue. Um, complete R part type graphs are determined by the R plus one deck. I showed you that. Um, what about the R deck? Can you get away with just the R deck to determine complete R part type graphs? Well, you know it's uh, complete multi part type. The only thing that could go wrong is maybe there are complete R part type and R plus one part type graphs with the same R deck. And we found an example for r equals 3 where this is true. So here's a complete three-part type graph and a complete four-part type graph that have the same three deck. OK, so maybe you can generalize this construction or, or find other such constructions to 
to somehow this would show sharpness of the result that complete R part type graphs are determined by their R plus one depth. So finally, you can study almost anything. You can ask, what do you need to be able to reconstruct the connectivity of your graph, the matching number, the chromatic number, planarity, any kind of parameter or property of the graph? Uh, what do we, how big subgraphs do we need in the deck to be able to reconstruct that property or parameter of the original graph? Meaning that all reconstructions would have the same value of that parameter or property. So I hope I've um, encouraged you to uh, investigate this area. I think there are a lot of interesting questions um, in, in this um, study or this topic of what, how much do you need to know to reconstruct something about the graph. So thank you very much for your attention. I apologize for taking some extra time. Professor Arumagam, you're muted. <laughs> Professor, you're muted. Well, uh, are there any questions? Let me ask. New questions in the room. Let me turn up the volume here so I can hear the questions. Okay. Are there any questions? I'm happy to. Hi, Doug. Uh, this is Prasad. I have a oh, question. Prasad, hi. Uh -huh. um, uh, so uh, I was curious about algorithmic implications. So two, oh, I guess. Oh, oh. <laughs> well, two um, two questions. Let me let me pose okay, two questions. One is, you ask if question, the conjecture is true, yeah. does it give any interesting algorithmic consequences for I don't know, you know graph isomorphism? Okay. You name okay. it, right? And okay. the second so, is so this is a comment I should make. Uh, a <laughs> comment I should make that the the questions about reconstruction are non-algorithmic questions. That when we right. talk about reconstruction, we do not care how long yeah. it takes to compute anything. So, <laughs> um, for example, um, it's a well-known result of Tut that with one reconstruction, the ordinary reconstruction problem, you can mm -hmm. reconstruct how many Hamiltonian cycles there are. Mm -hmm. Okay, no problem. Uh, it's a the computation, sure, is exponential, but we don't care. So, yeah. um, so I think that the, the spirit of it is first yeah. of all, that we don't care how long it takes to compute anything. And, um, and then the more practical question, can you actually tell anything? Well, if you look into the procedures that you're using to reconstruct such and such, well then, yes, the procedure, for example, for the degree list, in situations where we know that we can reconstruct the degree list. Well, that's probably um, a polynomial time procedure, right? But uh, yeah, so the reconstruction is not, uh, reconstruction arguments, I think, are not helping you compute anything that you didn't already know was easy to compute. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so that's, that's one response. Uh, did you have yeah. a second question? No, I, uh, right. I understood that the question and the mathematics doesn't directly ask whether it's computationally feasible, but I was curious, you know, one way to refute, I was thinking was, suppose the conjecture is true, hmm. right? Just in terms of logic or whatever you, you want to call it, what are some implications? Uh, and maybe some of the implications can be shown to be shown to lead to what people might believe to be true or not and so on. Yeah, that's the spirit. Yeah, I, I mean, I guess you could draw some confusion, 
uh, conclusions that certain things are computable, but not efficiently. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, got it. Thanks. Okay. Any more questions? Since there are no questions, so on behalf of the organizing committee, I thank Professor Douglas West, Professor Armugam, and all the participants for attending the session. Thank you all. Again, again thank you for indulging me with the extra time. Thank you. With that, we come to the end of day two session. We stretched over for more than 11 hours. And tomorrow, we will start the third day session at 9.30 Indian time. Thank you.